Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording by Vivian Weaver. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ben Greenway is convinced that Bonnet is a pirate. But how in the name o' common sense did ye ever think of becoming a pirate, Master Bonnet? said Ben Greenway as they stood together. You're so little fitted for a wicked life. Out upon you, Ben Greenway, exclaimed the captain, beginning to stride up and down the little quarter-deck. I will let you know that, when the time comes for it, I can be as wicked as anybody. I doubt that, said Ben sturdily. Would ye cut down and murder the innocent? Would ye drive them upon an unsteady plank and make them walk into the sea? Could ye raise thy great sword upon the widow and the orphan? No more of this disloyal speech, shouted Bonnet, or I will put you upon a wavering plank and make you walk into the sea. Now Greenway laughed. And if ye did, he said, ye would next jump upon the plank yourself and slide swiftly into the waves, that ye might save your old friend and servant, knowing he cannot swim. Ben Greenway, said Bonnet, folding his arms and knitting his brows, I will not suffer such speech from you. I would sooner have on board a Presbyterian parson. And a happier fate couldn't have befall ye, said Ben, for ye need a parson more than any mon I know. Bonnet looked at him for a moment. You think so, said he? Indeed I do, said Ben, with unction. There now, cried Bonnet, I told you, Ben, that I could be wicked upon occasion, and now you have acknowledged it. Upon my word I can be wickeder than common, as you shall see when good fortune helps us to overhaul a prize. The revenge had been at sea for about a week, and all had gone well, except she had taken no prizes. The crew had been obedient and fairly orderly, and if they made fun of their farmer captain behind his back, they showed no disrespect when his eyes were upon them. The fact was that most of them had a very great respect for him as the capitalist of the ship's company. Big Sam had early begun to sound the temper of the men, but they had not cared to listen to him. Good fare they had and generous treatment, and the less they thought of Bonnet as a navigator and commander, the more they thought of his promises of rich spoils to be fairly divided with them, when they should capture a Spanish galleon on any well-laden merchantman bound for the marts of Europe. In fact, when such good luck should befall them, they would greatly prefer to find themselves serving under Bonnet than under Big Sam. The latter was known as a greedy scoundrel, who would take much and give little, being inclined, moreover, to cheat his shipmates out of even that little if the chance came to him. Even Black Paul, who was an old comrade of Big Sam, the two having done much wickedness together, paid no heed to his present treasons. Let the old fool alone, he said. We fare well, and our lives are easy, having three men to do the work of one. So say I, let us sail on and make merry with his good rum. His money chest is heavy set. That's what I'm thinking of, said the sailing master. Why should I be coursing about here looking for prizes with that chest within reach of my very arm whenever I choose it? Black Paul grinned and said to himself, It is your arm, old Sam, that I'm afraid of. Then aloud, No, let him go. Let us profit by our good treatment as long as it lasts. And then we will talk about the money box. Thus Big Sam found that his time had not arrived and he swore in his soul that his old shipmate would some day rue that he had not earlier stood by him in his treacherous schemes. So all went on without open discontent, and Bonnet, having sailed northward for some days, set his course to the southeast, with some hundred and fifty eyes wide open for the sight of a heavy sailing merchantman. One morning they sighted a brig sailing southward, but as she was of no great size, and not going in the right direction to make it probable that she carried a cargo worth their while, they turned westward and ran towards Cuba. Had Captain Bonnet known that his daughter was on the brig which he thus disdained, his mind would have been far different. But as it was, not knowing anything more than he could see, and not understanding much of that, he kept his westerly course. And on the next day, the lookout sighted a good-sized merchantman bearing eastward now bounded every heart upon the swiftly coursing vessel of the planter pirate there were men there who had shared in the taking of many a prize who had shared in the blood and the cruelty and the booty 
and their brawny forms trembled with the old excitement of the sea chase but no man's blood ran more swiftly no man's eyes glared more fiercely than those of captain bonnet as he strapped on his pistols and felt of his sword hilt ah ye need na glare so said ben greenway close at his side ye are no pirate and ye cannot make yourself believe ye are many and that ye shall see when the guns begin to roar and the sword blades flash better get below and let any of those hairy scoundrels descend into hell in your place captain bonnet turned with rage upon ben greenway but the latter having spoken his mind and given his advice had retired now came big sam tis an english brig he said most likely from jamaica homeward bound she should be a good prize bonnet winced a little at this he would have preferred to begin his career of piracy by capturing some foreign vessel leaving english prizes for the future when he should have become better used to his new employment but sensitiveness does not do for pirates and in a moment he had recovered himself and was as bold and bloody-minded as he had been when he first saw the now rapidly approaching vessel all nations were alike to him now he belonged to no one fire some guns at her he shouted to big sam and run up the jolly roger let the rascals see what we are the rascals saw down came their flag and presently their vessel was steered into the wind and lay to shall we board her cried big sam ay board her shouted back the infuriated bonnet run the revenge alongside get out your grappling irons and let every man with sword and pistols bound upon her deck the merchantman now lay without headway gently rolling on the sea down came the sails of the revenge while her motion grew slower and slower as she approached her victim had captain bonnet been truly sailing the revenge he would have run by with sails all set for not a thought had he for the management of his own vessel so intent he was upon the capture of the other but fortunately big sam knew what was necessary to be done in a nautical manoeuvre of this kind and his men not all stand ready with their swords in their hands to bound upon the deck of the merchantman but there were enough of pirate bonnet's crew crowded alongside the rail of the vessel to inspire terror in any peaceable merchantman and this one although it had several carronades and other guns upon her deck showed no disposition to use them the odds against her being far too great at the very head of the long line of ruffians upon the deck of the revenge stood ben greenway and although he held no sword and wore no pistol his eyes flashed as brightly as any glimmering blade in the whole ship's company the two vessels were now drawing very near to each other men with grappling irons stood ready to throw them and the bow of the well-steered pilot had almost touched the side of the merchantman when with a bound of which no one would have considered him capable the good ben greenway jumped upon the rail and sprang down upon the deck of the other vessel this was a hazardous feat and if the scotchman had known more about nautical matters he would not have essayed it before the two vessels had been fastened together ignorance made him fearless and he alighted in safety on the deck of the merchantman at the very instant when the two vessels having touched separated themselves from each other for the space of a yard or two there was a general shout from the deck of the pirate at this performance of ben greenway nobody could understand it captain bonnet stood and yelled what are you about ben greenway have you gone mad without sword or pistol you'll be the astonished bonnet did not finish his sentence for his power of speech left him when he saw ben greenway hurry up to the captain of the merchantman who was standing unarmed with his crew about him and warmly shake that dumbfounded skipper by the hand in their surprise at what they beheld the pirates had not thrown their grapnels at the proper moment and now the two vessels had drifted still farther apart presently ben greenway came hurrying to the side of the merchantman dragging its captain by the hand master bonnet master bonnet he cried this is your old friend abder marchman o oh, our town and this is his good ship the amanda i knew her when i first caught sight of her figurehead having seen it so often at her pier at bridgetown and so now that ye know what it is that ye have inadvertently captured ye may cast off your men and bid them sheave their frightful cutlasses at this a roar arose from the pirates who having thrown some of their grappling irons over the gunwale of the merchantman were now pulling hard upon them to bring the two vessels together 
and Captain Bonnet shouted back at Ben. What are you talking about, you driveling idiot? Haven't you told Mr. Marchand that I am a pirate? Indeed I had not, cried Ben, for I don't believe ye are, at least no to your friends and neighbors. To this Bonnet made a violent reply, but it was not heard. The two vessels had now touched, and the crowd of yelling pirates had leaped upon the deck of the Amanda. Bonnet was not far behind his men, and, sword in hand, he rushed towards the spot where stood the merchant captain with his crew, hustling together behind him. As there was no resistance, there was so far no fighting, and the pirates were tumbling over each other in their haste to get below and find out what sort of a cargo was carried by this easy prize. Captain Marchand held out his hand. Good day to you, friend Bonnet, he said. I had hoped that you would be one of the first friends I should meet when I reached port at Bridgetown, but I little thought to meet you before I got there. Bonnet was a little embarrassed by the peculiarity of this situation, but his heart was true to his new career. Friend Marchand, he said, I see that you do not understand the state of affairs, and Ben Greenway there should have told you the moment he met you. I am no longer a planter of Barbados. I am a pirate of the sea, and the Jolly Roger floats above my ship. I belong to no nation. My hand is against all the world. You and your ship have been captured by me and my men, and your cargo is my prize. Now what have you got on board? Where do you hail from, and whither are you bound? Captain Marchton looked at him fixedly. I sailed from London with a cargo of domestic goods for Kingston. Thence, having disposed of most of my cargo, I am on my way to Bridgetown, where I hope to sell the remainder. Your goods will never reach Bridgetown, cried Bonnet. They belong now to my men and me. What? cried Ben Greenway. Yes, speak without sense or reason. Have ye forgotten that this is Mr. Abner Marchand, your fellow vestryman and your senior warden? And to him do ye talk o' taking away his goods and legal chattels? Bonnet looked at Greenway with indignation and contempt. Now listen to me, he yelled, to the devil with the vestry and de. Uh... The Scotchman's eyes and mouth were so rounded with horror that Bonnet stopped and changed his form of expression. Confound the senior warden. I am the pirate Bonnet, and regard not the Church of England. Nor your friends? interpolated Ben. Nor friends nor any man, shouted Bonnet. Abner Marchand, I am sorry that your vessel should be the first one to fall into my power. But that has happened, and there is no help for it. My men are below ransacking your hold for the goods and treasure it may contain. When your cargo, or what we want of it, is safe upon my ship, I shall burn your vessel, and you and your men must walk the plank. At this dreadful statement, Ben Greenway staggered backward in speechless dismay. Yes, cried Bonnet, that shall I do, for there is naught else I can do. And then you shall see, you doubting Greenway, whether I am a pirate or no. To all this Captain Marchand said not a word, but at this moment a woman's scream was heard from below, and there was another scream from another woman. Captain Marchand started. Your men have wandered into my cabin, he exclaimed, and they have frightened my passengers. Shall I go and bring them up, Major Bonnet? They will be better here. Ay, ay, cried the pirate captain, surprised that there should be female passengers on board, and Marchand, followed by Ben Greenway, disappeared below. Confound woman passengers, said Bonnet to himself, that is truly a bit of bad luck. In a few minutes Marchand was back, bringing with him a middle-aged and somewhat pudgy woman, very pale, a younger woman of exceeding plainness and sobbing steadfastly, and also an elderly man, evidently an invalid, and wearing a long dressing-gown. These, said Captain Marchand, are Master and Madame Ballinger and daughter of New York and England, who have been sojourning in Jamaica for the health of the gentlemen, but are now sailing with me to Barbados, hoping the air of our good island may be more salubrious for the lungs. Captain Bonnet had never been in the habit of speaking loudly before ladies, but he now felt that he must stand by his character. You cannot have heard, he almost shouted, that I am the pirate bonnet, and that your vessel is now my prize. At this the two ladies began to scream vigorously, and the form of the gentleman trembled to such a degree that his cane beat a tattoo upon the deck. Yes, continued Bonnet, when my men have stripped this ship of its valuables, I shall burn her to the water's edge, and having removed you to my vessel, I shall shortly make you walk the plank. Here the younger lady began to stiffen herself out as if she were about to faint in the arms of Captain Marchand 
who had suddenly seized her but her great curiosity to hear more kept her still conscious mrs ballinger grew very red in the face that cannot be she cried you may do what you please with our belongings and with captain martin's ship but my husband is too sick a man to walk a plank you have not noticed perchance that his legs are so feeble that he could scarce mount from the cabin to the deck it would be impossible for him to walk a plank and as for my daughter and myself we know nothing about such a thing and could not out of sheer ignorance for a moment a shadow of perplexity fell upon captain bonnet's face he could readily perceive that the infirm mr ballinger could not walk a plank or even mount one unless some one went with him to assist him and as to his wife she was evidently a termagant and having sailed his ship and floated his jolly roger in order to get rid of one termagant he was greatly annoyed at being brought thus face to face with another he stood for a moment silent the old gentleman looked as if he would like to go down to his cabin and cover up his head with his blanket until all this commotion should be over the daughter sobbed as she gazed about her taking in every point of this most novel situation and the mother with dilated nostrils still glared in the midst of all this very disturbance captain marchand stood quiet and unmoved apparently paying no attention to any one except his old neighbor and fellow vestryman steed bonnet upon whose face his eyes were steadily fixed ben greenway now approached the pirate captain and led him aside let your men make away with the cargo as they please i doubt if it be more than odds and ends for such are the goods they bring to bridgetown and let them cast off and go their way and ye and i will run to bridgetown in the amanda and i may yet be weel this beat of folly being forgotten it might have been supposed that bonnet would have retaliated upon the scotchman for thus advising him in the very moment of triumph to give up his piratical career and to go home quietly to his plantation but instead of that he paused for a moment's reflection ben greenway said there is good sense in what you say in truth i cannot bring myself to put to death my old friend and neighbor and his helpless passengers as for the ship it will do me no more good burned than unburned and there is another thing ben greenway which i would fain do and it just came into my mind i will write a letter to my wife and one to my daughter kate there is much which i wish them to know and which i have not yet been able to communicate i will allow the amanda to go on her way and i will send these two letters by her captain they shall be ready presently and you ben stand by these people and see that no harm comes to them at this moment there were loud shouts and laughter from below and captain marchin came forward friend bonnet he said your men have discovered my store of spirits in a short time they will be drunk and it will then be unsafe for these my passengers bid them i pray you to convey the liquors aboard your ship well said cried bonnet i would not lose those spirits and stepping forward he spoke to big sam who had just appeared on deck and ordered the casks to be conveyed on board the revenge the latter left but said ay ay sir returning to captain marchin bonnet said i will now step on board my ship and write some letters which i shall ask you to take to bridgetown with you i shall be ready by the time the rest of your cargo is removed oh don't do that cried ben there is surely pen and paper here close to your hand go down to captain marchin's cabin and write your letters no no cried bonnet i have my own conveniences and with that he leaped on board the revenge that's a chance gone said ben greenway to captain marchin a good chance gone if we could have kept him on board here and down in your cabin i might have passed the word to that big merchant the sailing master to cast off and get away with the wretched crowd the scoundrels will be glad to steal the ship and it will be the salvation of master bonnet if they do it if that's the case said captain marchin why should we resort to trickery if his men want the ship and don't want him why can't we seize him when he comes on board with his letters and then let his men know that they are free to go to the devil in any way they please then we can convey major bonnet to his home to repentance perhaps and a better life that's good said ben but no to punishment he and i could testify that his head is turned but that when kindness to a neighbor is concerned his heart is all right ay ay said the captain i could swear to that and now we must act together 
When I put my hand on him, you do the same, and give him no chance to use his sword or pistols. The captain of the pirates sat down in his well-furnished little room to write his letters, and the noise and confusion on deck, the swearing and the singing and the shouting to be heard everywhere, did not seem to disturb him in the least. He was a man whose mind could thoroughly engage itself with but one thing at a time, and the fact that his men were at work, sacking the merchantmen, did not in the least divert his thoughts from his pen and paper. So he quietly wrote to his wife that he had embraced a pirate's life, that he never expected to become a planter again, and that he left to her the enjoyment and management of his estate in Barbados. He hoped that his absence, having now relieved her of her principal reason for discontent with her lot, she would become happy and satisfied, and would allow those about her to be the same. He expected to send Ben Greenway back to her to help take care of her affairs, but if she should need further advice, he advised her to speak to Master Newcomb. The letter to his daughter was different. It was very affectionate. He assured her of his sorrow at not being able to take her with him and to leave her at Jamaica, and he urged her at the earliest possible moment to go to her uncle and to remain there until she heard from him or saw him, the latter being probable as he intended to visit Jamaica as soon as he could, even in disguise if this method was necessary. He alluded to the glorious career upon which he was entering, and in which he expected some day to make great name for himself, of which he hoped she would be proud. When these letters were finished, Bonnet hurried to the side of the vessel and looked upon the deck of the Amanda. Captain Marchant and Greenway had been waiting in anxious expectation for the return of Bonnet and wondering how in the world a man could bring his mind to write letters at such a time as this. Take these letters, Ben, he said, leaning over the rail, and give them to Captain Marchand. Ben Greenway at first declined to take the letters which Bonnet held out to him, but the latter now threw them at his feet on the deck, and running forward, he soon found himself in a violent and disorderly crowd, who did not seem to regard him at all. Booty and drink were all they cared for. Presently came Big Sam, giving orders and thrusting them in before him. He had not been drinking, and was in full possession of his crafty senses. "'Throw off the grapnels!' exclaimed Big Sam, and get up the foresail. And then he perceived Bonnet. With a scowl upon his face, Big Sam muttered, "'I thought you were on the merchantmen, but no matter. Shove her off, I say, or I'll break your heads.' The grapnels were loosened, the few men who were on duty shoved desperately. The foresail went up, and the two vessels began to separate." but they were not a foot apart when with a great rush and scramble ben greenway left the merchantman and tumbled himself on board the revenge bonnet rushed to him you scoundrel you rascal ben greenway what do you mean i intended you to go back to bridgetown on that brig can i never get rid of you no till you give up piratin said ben with a grin you may split open my head and throw overboard my corpse but my live body stays here as long as you do with a savage growl, Bonnet turned away from his faithful adherent. Things are getting very serious now, and he could waste no time on personal quarrels. Great holes and splits had been discovered in the heads of the barrels of spirits, and the precious liquor was running over the decks. This was the work of the sagacious Big Sam, who had the strongest desire to get away from the Amanda before the pirate crew became so drunk that they could not manage the vessel. He was a deep man, that Big Sam, and at this moment, although he said nothing about it, he considered himself the captain of the pirate ship which he sailed. For a time, Bonnet hurried about, not knowing what to do. Some of the men were quarreling about the booty, others trying to catch the rum as it flowed from the barrels, others howling out of pure devilishness, and no one paying him any respect whatever. Big Sam was giving orders. A few sober men were obeying him, and Captain Steed Bonnet, with his faithful servant, Ben Greenway, seemed to be entirely out of place amid this horrible tumult. I told ye, said Ben, ye had better stayed on board that merchantman and gone back like a Christian to your home and family. It will be no safe place for ye, or for me neither, when the black-hearted scoundrel, oh, a big Sam, gets time to attend to ye. Black-hearted? inquired Bonnet, but without any surprise in his voice. Ay, said Ben, if there's anything blacker than his heart, only Satan himself ever looked at it. It was to be sailed in this ship, on his own account, that he's had in his villainous soul ever since he came on board. And I can tell ye, Master Bonnet, that it won't be long now before he's doing it. 
I had me eye on him when he was on board the Amanda, and I saw that the scoundrel was going to separate the ships. That was my will, said Bonnet, although I did not order it. Ben gave a little grunt. Ay, said he, hoping to leave me behind just as he was hoping to leave ye behind. But neither o ye got your wills, and it'll be the dale that'll have a hand in the next leaving behind that's likely to be done. Bonnet made no reply to these remarks, having suddenly spied Black Paul. Look here, said he, stepping up to that sombre hued personage. Can you sail a ship? The other looked at Bonnet in astonishment. I should say so, said he. I have commanded vessels before now. Here, then, said Bonnet, I want a sailing master. I am not satisfied with this big Sam. I am no navigator myself, but I want a better man than that fellow to sail my ship for me. Black Paul looked hard at him, but made no answer. He thinks he is sailing the ship for himself, said Bonnet, and it would be a bad day for you men if he did. That indeed would it, said Black Paul, a close-fisted scoundrel, as I know him to be. Quick, then, said Bonnet, now you're my sailing master, and after this, when we divide the prizes, you take the same share that I do. As to these goods from the Amanda, I will have no part at all. I give them all to you and the rest, divided according to rule. Go you now among the men, and speak first to such as have taken the least liquor. Let them know that it was Big Sam that broke in the hogsheads, which, but for that, would have been sold and divided. Go quickly and get about you a half dozen good fellows. You're getting wickeder and wickeder, said Ben, when Black Paul had hurried away. The Dell himself couldn't have taught you a craftier trick than that. Will you ken then that black fellow would fin serve under a free-handed fool than a stingy knife? Ay, sir, your education's progressing. At this moment, Big Sam came hurrying by, not wishing to excite suspicion. Bonnet addressed him a question but instead of answering the burly pirate swore at him i'll attend to your business said he as soon as i have my sails set then i'll give you two leather-headed landsmen all the hoisting and lowering you'll ever ask for then with another explosion of oaths he passed on bonnet and ben stood waiting with much impatience and anxiety but presently came black paul with a party of brawny pirates following him come now said bonnet walking boldly aft towards big sam who was still cursing and swearing right and left bonnet stepped up to him and touched him on the arm look ye said he you're no longer sailing master on this ship i don't like your ways or your fashions step forward then and go to the forecastle where you belong this good mariner pointing to black paul will take your place and sail a revenge big sam turned and stood astounded staring at bonnet he spoke no word but his face grew dark and his great eyebrows were drawn together his mouth was half open as if he were about to yell or swear then suddenly his right hand fell upon the hilt of his cutlass and the great blade flashed in the air he gave one bound towards bonnet and in the same second the cutlass came down like a stroke of lightning but bonnet had been a soldier and had learned how to use his sword the cutlass was caught on his quick blade and turned aside at this moment black paul sprung at big sam and seized him by the sword arm while another fellow taking his cue grabbed him by the shoulder now some of you fellows shouted bonnet seize him by the legs and heave him overboard this order was obeyed almost as soon as it was given four burly pirates rushed big sam to the bulwarks and with a great heave sent him head foremost over the rail in the next instant he had disappeared gone passed out of human sight or knowledge now then mr paul not knowing your other name which it is bittern said the other you are now sailing master of this ship and when things are straightened out a bit you can come below and sign articles with me ay ay sir said black paul and calling to the men he gave orders that they go on with the setting of the main topsail now truly said ben i believe that ye are a pirate bonnet looked at him much pleased i told you so my good ben i knew that the time would come when you would acknowledge that i am a true pirate after this you cannot doubt it any more never again master bonnet said ben greenway bravely shaking his hand never again the brig amanda with full sails and an empty hold bent her course eastward to the island of barbados and the next morning when the drunken sailors on board the revenge were able to look about them and consider things they found their vessel speeding towards the coast of cuba and sailed by black paul bittern End of chapter eight
Chapter 9 of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording by Vivian Weaver. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dickory sets forth. Mr. Felix Delaplaine, merchant and planter of Spanish Town, the capital of Jamaica, occupied a commodious house in the suburbs of the town twelve miles up the river from kingston the seaport which establishment was somewhat remarkable from the fact that there were no women in the family madame delaplaine had been dead for several years and as her husband's fortune had steadily thriven he now found himself possessor of a home in which he could be as independent and as comfortable as if he had been the president and sole member of a club being of a genial disposition and disposed to look most favorably upon his possessions and surrounding conditions mr delaplaine had come to be of the opinion that his lot in life was one in which improvement was not to be expected and scarcely to be desired he had been perfectly happy with his wife and had no desire to marry another who could not possibly equal her and having no children he continually thanked his happy stars that he was free from the troubles and anxieties which were so often brought upon fathers by their sons and their daughters into this quiet and self-satisfied life came one morning a great surprise in the shape of a beautiful young woman who entered his office in spanish town and who stated to him that she was the daughter of his only sister and that she had come to live with him there was an elderly dame and a young man in company with the beautiful visitor but mr delaplaine took no note of them with his niece's hands in his own gazing into the face so like that young face in whose company he had grown from childhood to manhood mr delaplaine saw in a flash that since the death of his wife until that moment he had never had the least reason to be content with the world or to be satisfied with his lot this was his sister's child come to live with him when mr delaplaine sufficiently recovered his ordinary good sense to understand that there were other things in this world besides the lovely niece who had so suddenly appeared before him he remembered that she had a father and many questions were asked and answered and he was told who dame charter was and why her son came with her then the uncle and the niece walked into the garden and there talked of major bonnet little did kate know upon this subject and nothing could her uncle tell her but in many and tender words she was assured that this was her home as long as she chose to live in it and that it was the most fortunate thing in the world that dame charter had come with her and could stay with her had this not been so where could he have found such a guardian angel such a chaperon for this tender niece as for the young man it was such rare good luck that he had been able to accompany the two ladies and give them his protection he was just the person mr delaplaine believed who would be invaluable to him either on the plantation or in his counting-house in any case here was their home and here too was the home of his brother-in-law bonnet whenever he chose to give up his strange fancy for the sea it was not now to be thought of that kate or her father or either one of them should go back to barbados to live with the impossible madame bonnet if her father's vessel were in the harbor and he were here with them or even if she had had good tidings from him kate bonnet would have been a very happy girl for her present abode was vastly different from any home she had ever known her uncle's house on the highlands beyond the town lay in a region of cooler breezes and more bracing air than that of barbados books and music and the general air of refinement recalled her early life with her mother and with the exception of the anxiety about her father there were no clouds in the bright blue skies of Kate Bonnet. But this anxiety was a cloud, and it was spreading. When the Amanda moved away from the side of the pirate vessel Revenge, she hoisted all sail and got away over the sea as fast as a prevailing wind could take her. When she passed the bar below Bridgetown and came to anchor, Captain Marchant immediately lowered a boat and was rowed up the river to the recent residence of Major Steed Bonnet and there he delivered two letters one to the wife of that gentleman and the other for his daughter then the captain rode back and went into the town where he annoyed and nearly distracted the citizens by giving them the most cautious and expurgated 
account of the considerate and friendly manner in which the amanda had been relieved of her cargo by his old friend and fellow vestryman major bonnet captain marchant had been greatly impressed by the many things which ben greenway had said about his master's present most astounding freak and hoping in his heart that repentance and a suitable reparation might soon give this hitherto estimable man an opportunity to return to his former place in society he said as little as he could against the name and fame of this once respected fellow-citizen when he communicated with the english owners of his new departed cargo he would know what to say to them but here safe in harbour with his vessel and his passengers he preferred to wait for a time before entirely blackening the character of the man who had been allowed to come here like the faithful ben greenway he did not yet believe in steed bonnet's piracy madame bonnet read her letter and did not like it in fact she thought it shameful then she opened and read the letter to her stepdaughter. This she did not like either, and she put it away in a drawer. She would have nothing to do with the transmission of such an epistle as this, most abominable when contrasted with the scurrilous screed he had written to her. Day after day passed on, and Kate Bonnet arose each morning feeling less happy than on the day before. But at last a letter came, brought by a French vessel which had touched at Barbados this letter was to kate from martin newcomb it was a love letter a very earnest ardent love letter but it did not make the young girl happy for it told her very little about her father the heart of the lover was so tender that he would say nothing to his lady which might give her needless pain he had heard what captain marchand had told and he had not understood it and could only half believe it kate must know far more about all this painful business than he did for her father's letter would tell her all he wished her to know therefore why should he discuss that most distressing and perplexing subject when he knew so little about and which she knew all about so he merely touched upon major bonnet and his vessel and hoped that she might soon write to him and tell him what she cared for him to know what she cared for him to tell to the people of bridgetown and what she wished to repose confidentially to his honour but whatever she chose to say to him or not to say to him he would have her remember that his heart belonged to her and ever would belong no matter what might happen or what might be said for good or for bad on the sea or the land by friends or enemies this was a rarely good love letter but it plunged kate into the deepest woe and dickory saw this first of all he had brought the letter and for the second time he saw tears in her eyes the absence of news of major bonnet was soon known to the rest of the family and then there were other tears it was perfectly plain even to dame charter that things had been said in bridgetown which mr newcombe had not cared to write no dame charter said kate i cannot talk to you about it my uncle has already spoken words of comfort but neither you nor he know more than i do and i must now think a little for myself if i can so saying, she walked out into the grounds to a spot at a little distance where Dickory stood, reflectively gazing out over the landscape. Dickory, said the girl, my mind is filled with horrible doubts. I have heard of the talk in Bridgetown before we left, and now here is this letter from Mr. Newcomb from which I cannot fail to see that there must have been other talk that he considerately refrains from telling me. He should not have written such a letter, exclaimed Dickory hotly. He might have known it would have set you to suspecting things. You don't know what you are talking about, you foolish boy, said she. It is a very proper letter about things you don't understand. She stepped a little closer to him, as if she feared someone might hear her. Dickory, said she, he did not put that thing into my mind. It was there already. That was a dreadful ship, Dickory, and it was filled with dreadful men. If he had not intended to go with them, he would not have put himself into their power. And if he had not intended to be long away, he would not have planned to leave me here with my uncle. You ought not to think such a thing as that for one minute, cried Dickory. I would not think so about my mother, no matter what happened. She smiled slightly as she answered, I would my father were a mother, and then I need not think such things. But, Dickory, if he had written to me, and in all this time he might have written, knowing how I must feel. Dickory stood silent, his bosom heaving. Suddenly he turned sharply towards her. 
Of course he has written, said he, but how could his letter come to you? We know not where he has sailed, and besides, who could have told him you had already gone to your uncle? But the people at Bridgetown must know things. I believe that he has written there. Why do you believe that? she asked eagerly, with one hand on his arm. I think it, said Dickory, his cheeks a little ruddier in their brownness. Because there is more known than the master newcomb chose to put into his letter. If he has not written, how should they know more? She now looked straight into his eyes, and as he returned the gaze, he could see in her pupils his head and straw hat with the clear sky beyond. Dickory, she said, if he wrote to anybody, he also wrote to me, and that letter is still there. That is what I believe, said he, and I have been believing it. Then why didn't you say so to me, you wretched boy? cried Kate. You ought to have known how that would have comforted me, if I could only think he has surely written. My heart would bow no matter what his letter told. But to be utterly dropped, that I cannot bear. You have not been dropped, he exclaimed, and you shall know it, Kate. I am going, nay, nay, she exclaimed. You must not call me that. But you call me Dickory, he said. True, but you are so much younger. Younger, he exclaimed, in a tone of contempt, not for the speaker, but for the word she had spoken. Eleven months. She laughed a little laugh. Her nature was so full of it that even now she could not keep it back. You must have been making careful computation, she said, but it does not matter. You must not call me Kate, and I shall keep on calling you Dickory. I could not help it. Now, where is it you were about to say you were going? If you think me old enough, said he, I am going to Barbados in the King and Queen. She sails tomorrow. I shall find out about everything, and I shall get your letter. Then I shall come back and bring it to you. Dickory, she exclaimed, and her eyes glowed. There was silence for some moments, and then he spoke, for it was necessary for him to say something, although he would have been perfectly content to stand there speechless so long as her eyes still glowed. If I don't go, said he, it may be long before you hear from him. Having written, he will wait for an answer. She thought of no difficulties, no delays, no dangers. How happy you have made me, Dickory, she said. It is this dreadful ignorance these fearful doubts of which I ought to be ashamed. But if I get his letter, if I know he has not deserted me, you shall get it, he cried, and you shall know. Dickory, said she, you said that exactly as you spoke when you told me that if I let myself drop into the darkness, you would be there. And you shall find me there now, said he. Always, if you need me, you shall find me there. Dame Charter had been standing and watching this interview her foolish motherly heart filled with the brightest, most unreasonable dreams. And why should she not dream, even if she knew her dreams would never come true? In a few short weeks that Dickory boy had grown to be a man, and what should not be dreamed about a man? As Kate ran by the open door towards her uncle's apartments, Dame Charter rose up, surprised. What have you been saying to her, Dickory? she exclaimed. Do you know something we have not heard? Have you been giving her news of her father? No, said the son, who had so lately been a boy. I have no news to give her, but I am going to get news for her. She looked at him in amazement. Then she exclaimed, You! Yes, he said, there is no one else, and besides, I would not want anyone else to do it. I am going to Bridgetown in the brig which brought us here. It is a little sail, and when I get there I will find out everything. No matter what has happened... It will break her heart to think that her father deserted her without a word. I don't believe he did it, and I shall go and find out. But Dickory, she said, with anxious, upraised face, how can you get back? Do you know of any vessel that will be sailing this way? He laughed. Get back? If I go alone, dear mother, you may be sure I shall soon get back. Craft of all kinds sail one way or another and there are many ways in which I can get back not thought of in ordinary passage. When any kind of vessel sails from Jamaica, I can get on board of her, whether she takes passengers or not. I can sleep on a bale of goods or on the bare deck. I can work with the crew if need be. Oh, you need not doubt that I shall speedily come back. They talked long together, this mother and this son, and it was her golden dreams for him that made her invoke heaven's blessings upon him, and tell him to go. She knew, too, that it was wise for her to tell him to go and to bless him, 
for it would have been impossible to withstand him, so set was he in his purpose. I tell you, Dame Charter, said Mr. Delaplaine, an hour later, this son of yours should be a great credit and pride to you, and he will be. I stake my word upon it. He is now, said the good woman, quietly. I have been pondering in my brain, said he, what I should do to relieve my niece of this burden of anxiety which is weighing upon her. I could see no way, for letters would be of no use not knowing where to send them, and it would be dreary indeed to sit and wait and sigh and dream bad dreams until chance throws some light upon this grievous business. And here steps up this young fellow and settles the whole matter. When he comes back, Dame Charter, I shall do well for him. I shall put him in my counting-house, for although doubtless he would fain live his young life in the fields and under the open sky, he will find the counting-house lies on the road to fortune and good fortune he deserves if that loving mother could have composed this speech for master delaplaine to make she could not have suited it better to her desires when the king and queen was nearly ready to sail dickory charter having been detained by mr delaplaine who wished the young man to travel as one of importance and plentiful resources hurried to the house to take his final instructions from mistress kate bonnet in whose service he was now setting forth it might have been supposed by some that no further instructions were necessary but how could dickory know that he was right kate met him before he reached the house i am so glad to see you again before you sail she said one thing was forgotten you may see my father his cruise may be over and he may be even now preparing for me to come back to bridgetown if this be so urge him rather to come here I had not thought of your seeing him, Dickory, and I did not write to him. But you will know what to say. You have heard that woman talk to me, and you well know that I cannot go back to my old home. Oh, I will say all that, he exclaimed. It will be the same thing as if you had written him a long letter. And now I must run back, for the boat is ready to take me down the river to the port. Dickory, said she, and she put out her hand. He had never held that hand before you are so true dickory you are so noble you are going it was in her mind to say you are going as my knight-errant but she deemed that unsuitable and she changed it to you are going to do so much for me she stopped for a moment and then she said you know i told you you should not call me kate being so much younger but as you are so much younger you may kiss me if you like like end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording by Vivian Weaver. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Christopher Vince. It was truly surprising to see the change which came over the spirits of our young Kate Bonnet when she heard that the King and Queen had sailed from Kingston Port she was gay she was talkative she sang songs she skipped in the paths of the garden one might have supposed she was so happy to get rid of the young man on the brig which had sailed away and yet the news she might hear when that young man came back was likely to be far worse than any misgivings which had entered her mind kate's high spirits delighted her uncle this child of his sister had grown more lovely than even her mother had ever been now came days of delight which Kate had never dreamed of. She had not known that there were such shops in Spanish town, which, although a youngish town, had already drawn to itself the fashion and the needs of fashion of that prosperous colony. With Dame Charter and off and also with her uncle in company, this bright young girl hovered over fair fabrics which were spread before her, circled about jewels, gems, and feathers, and reveled in tender colors as they would a butterfly among the blossoms dripping and tasting as she flew there were some fine folk in spanish town and with this pleasant society of the captain mr delaplaine renewed his previous intercourse and kate soon learned the pleasures of a colonial social circle whose attractions brought from afar had been warmed into a more cheerful glow in this bright west indian atmosphere to add to the brilliancy of the new life into which kate now entered there came into the port an english corvette the badger for refitting 
from this welcome man of war there floated up the river to spanish town gallant officers young and older and in their flitting they flitted into the drawing-room of the rich merchant de la Plain. and there were some of them who soon found that there were no drawing-rooms in all the town where they could talk with walk with and perchance dance with such a fine girl as mistress kate bonnet kate greatly fancied gallant partners whether for walking or talking or dancing and among such those which came from the corvette in the harbor pleased her most those were not bright days for dame charter do what she would her optimism was growing dim and what helped to dim it was kate's gaiety it did not comfort her at all when kate told her that she was so light-hearted because she knew that dickory would bring her good news truly too many fine young men here thought dame charter while dickory is away and all of them together are not worth a curl on his head but although her dreams were dimmed she did not cease dreaming a stout-hearted woman was dickory's mother but it was not long before there were other people thereabout who began to feel that their prospects for present enjoyment were beginning to look a little dim her captain christopher vance having met mistress kate bonnet at an entertainment at the governor's house was greatly struck by this young lady each officer of the badger who saw their captain in company with the fair one to whom their gallant attentions had been so freely offered now felt that in love as well as in accordance with the regulations of the service he must give place to his captain moreover when the captain took upon himself the very next day to call at the residence of mr delaplaine and repeated the visit upon the next day and the following the crestfallen young fellows were compelled to acknowledge that there were other houses in the town where it might be better worth their while to spend their leisure hours captain vince was not a man to be lightly interfered with whether he happened to be engaged in the affairs of mars or cupid he was of a resolute mind and of a person more than usually agreeable to the female eye he was about forty years of age and an excellent english family and with good expectations he considered himself an admirable judge of women but he had never met one who so thoroughly satisfied his ascetic taste as this fair niece of the merchant de la Plain. she had beauty she had wit she had culture and the fair fabrics of spanish town shops gave to her attractions a setting which would have amazed and entranced master newcomb or our good dickory the soul of captain vince was fired and each time he met kate and talked with her the fire grew brighter he had never considered himself a marrying man but that was because he had never met any one he had cared to marry now things were changed here was a girl he had known but for a few days and already in his imagination he had placed her in the drawing-rooms of the english home he hoped soon to inherit more beautiful and even more like a princess than any noble dame who was likely to frequent those rooms in fancy he had seen her by his side walking through the shaded alleys of his grand old gardens he had looked proudly upon her as she stood by him in the assemblages of the great in fact he had fallen suddenly and absolutely in love with her when he was away from her he could not quite understand this condition of things but when he was with her again he understood it all he loved her because it was absolutely impossible for him to do anything else naturally captain vince was very agreeable to mistress kate for she had never seen such a handsome man taking into consideration his uniform and his bearing and had never talked with one who knew so well what to say and how to say it comparing him with the young officers who had been so fond of making their way to her uncle's house she was glad that they had ceased to be such frequent visitors the soul of mr delaplain was agitated by the admiration of his niece which captain vince took no trouble to conceal the worthy merchant would gladly have kept kate with him for years and years if she would have been content to stay but this could not be expected and if she married from what other quarter could come such a brilliant match as this what his brother-in-law might think about it he did not care if kate should choose to wed the captain such an eccentric and untrustworthy person should not be permitted to interfere with the destiny that now appeared to open before his daughter these thoughts were not so idle as might have been supposed for the captain had already said things to the merchant 
in which the circumstances of the former were made plain and his hopes foreshadowed if the captain were not prepared to leave the service this rich merchant thought why should not he make it possible for him to do so for the sake of his dear niece with these high ambitions in his mind the happily agitated mr delaplaine did not hesitate to say some playful words to kate concerning the captain of the badger having been received quietly he was emboldened to go on and say some other words more serious then kate looked at him very steadfastly and remarked but uncle you have forgotten master newcombe the good delaplaine made no answer for his emotions made it impossible for him to do so but rising he went out and at a little distance from the house he damned master newcombe days passed on and the captain's attentions did not wane mr delaplaine who was a man of honour expecting it in others made up his mind that something decisive must soon be said while kate began greatly to fear that something decisive might soon be said she was in a difficult position she was not engaged to martin newcombe but had believed she might be the whole affair involved a question which she did not want to consider and still the captain came every day generally in the afternoon or evening but one morning he made his appearance coming to the house quite abruptly i am glad to find you by yourself said he for i have some awkward news kate looked at him surprised i have just been ordered on duty he continued and the order is most unwelcome a brig came in last night and brought letters and the governor sent for me this morning i have just left him the cruise i am about to take may not be a long one but i cannot leave port without coming here to you and speaking to you of something which is nearer to my heart than any thought or service or in fact anything else speaking to my uncle you mean said kate now much disturbed for she saw in the captain's eyes what he wished to talk of away with uncles he exclaimed we can speak with them by and by now my words are for you you may think me hasty but we gentlemen serving the king cannot afford to wait and so without other pause i say sweet mistress kate i love you better than i have ever loved woman better than i can ever love another nay do not answer i must tell you everything before you reply and to the pale girl he spoke of his family his prospects and his hopes and the warmest colors he laid before her the life and love he would give her then he went quickly on this is but a little matter which is given to my charge and it may not engage me long i am going out in search of a pirate and i shall make short work of him the shorter having such good reason to get quickly back in fact he is not a real pirate anyway being but a country gentleman tiring of his rural life and liking better to rob burn and murder of the high seas he has already done so much damage that if his evil career he had not soon put an end to good people will be afraid to voyage in these waters so i am to sail in haste after this fellow bonnet but before kate's face had grown so white that it seemed to recede from her great eyes he is my father said she but i had not heard until now that he is a pirate the captain started from his chair what he cried your father yes i see it did not strike me until this instant that the names are the same kate rose and as she spoke her voice was not full and clear as it was wont to be he is my father she said but he sailed away without telling me his errand but now that i know everything i must if she had intended to say she must go she changed her mind and even came closer to the still astounded captain you say that you will make short work of his vessel do you mean that you will destroy it and will you kill him captain vince looked down upon her his face filled with the liveliest emotions my dear young lady he said and then he stopped as if not knowing what words to use but as he looked into her eyes fixed upon his own and waiting for his answer his love for her took possession of him and banished all else kill him he exclaimed never he shall be as safe in my hands as if he were walking in his own fields kill your father dearest loving you as i do that would be impossible i may take the rascals who are with him i may string them up by the yardarm or i may sink their pirate ship with all of them in it but your father shall be safe trust me for that he shall come to no harm from me she stepped a little way from him and some of her colour came back 
For some moments she looked at him without speaking, as if she did not exactly comprehend what he had said. Yes, my dear, he continued, I must crush out the piratical crew, for such is my duty as well as my wish. But your father I shall take under my protection, so have no fear about him, I beg you. With his ship and his gang of scoundrels taken away from him, he can no longer be a pirate, and you and I will determine what we shall do with him. You mean, said Kate, speaking slowly, that for my sake you will shield my father from the punishment which will be dealt out to his companions? He smiled, and his face beamed upon her. What blessed words, he exclaimed. Yes, for your sake, for your sweet dear sake, I will do anything. And as for this matter, I assure you there are so many ways. You mean, she interrupted, that for my sake you will break your oath of office? that you will be a traitor to your service and your king, that for my sake you will favor the fortunes of a pirate whom you are sent out to destroy? Mean it, if you please, but you will not do it. I love my father and would fain do anything to save him and myself and his great calamity. But I tell you, sir, that for my sake no man shall do himself dishonor. Without power to say another word, nor to keep back for another second the anguish which raged within her, she fled like a bird and was gone. The captain stretched out his arms as if he would seize her. He rushed to the door through which she had passed, but she was gone. He followed her, shouting to the startled servants who came. He swore and demanded to see their mistress. He rushed through rooms and corridors and even made as if he would mount the stairs. Presently a woman came to him and told him that under no circumstances could Mistress Bonnet now be seen but he would not leave the house. He called for writing materials, but in an instant threw down the pen. Again he called a servant and sent a message, which was of no avail. Dame Charter would have gone down to him, but Kate was in her arms. For several minutes the furious officer stood by the chair in which Kate had been sitting. He could not comprehend the fact that this girl had discarded and had scorned him, and yet her scorn had not in the least dampened the violence of his love. As she stood and spoke her last bitter words, the grandeur of her beauty had made him speechless to defend himself. He seized his hat and rushed from the house, hot and with blazing eyes. He appeared in the counting-room of Mr. Delaplaine, and there, to the astounded merchant, he told with brutal cruelty of his orders to destroy the pirate bonnet, his niece's father, and then he related the details of his interview with the niece herself. Mr. Delaplaine's continent, at first shocked and pained, grew gradually sterner and colder. Presently he spoke. I will hear no more such words, Captain Vince, he said, regarding the members of my family. You say my niece knows not what fortune she trifles with? I think she does. And when she told you she would not accept the offer of your dishonor, I commended her every word. Captain Vince frowned black as night and clapped his hand to his sword hilt, but the pale merchant made no movement of defense and the captain, striking his clenched fist against the table, dashed from the room. Before he reached his ship, he had sworn a solemn oath. He vowed that he would follow that pirate ship. He would kill, burn, destroy, annihilate, but out of the storm and the fire he would pick unharmed the father of the girl who had entranced him and had spurned him. He laughed savagely as he thought of it. With that dolt of a father in his hands, a man wearing always around his neck the hangman's noose, he would hold the card which would give him the game. What Mistress Kate Bonnet might say or do, what she might like or might not like, what her ideas about honor might be or might not be, it would be a very different thing when he, her imperious lover, should hold the end of that noose in his hand. She might weep, she might rave, but come what would, she was the man's daughter and she would be Lady Vince. So he went on board the badger, and he cursed, and he commanded, and he raged, and his officers and his men, when the hurried violence of his commands gave them a chance to speak to each other, muttered that they had pitied the pirate and his crew when the badger came up with them. Clouds settled down upon the home of Mr. Delaplaine. There were no visitors. There was no music. There seemed to be no sunshine. The beautiful fabrics, the jewels, and the feathers were seen no more. It was Kate of the Broken Heart who wandered around the trees and among the blossoms. 
and she knew not that there existed such things as cooling shade and sweet fragrance. She could not be comforted, for although her uncle told her that he had information that her father's ship had sailed northward, and that it was therefore likely that the corvette would not overtake him, she could not forget that whatever of good or evil befell that father he was a pirate and he had deserted her so they said but little the uncle and the niece who sorrowed quietly dame charter was in a strange state of mind during the frequent visits of captive mince she had been apprehensive and troubled and her only comfort was that the badger had merely touched at this port to refit and that she must soon sail away and take with her her captain the good woman had begun to expect and to hope for the return of degree but later she had blessed her stars that he was not there he was a fiery boy her brave son but it would have been a terrible thing for him to become involved with an officer in the navy a man with a long keen sword now that the captain had raged himself away from the delaplaine house her spirits rose and her great fear was that the corvette might not leave port before the brig came in if dickory should hear of the things that captain had said but she banished such thoughts from her mind she could not bear them after some days the corvette sailed and the governor spoke well of the diligence and ardor which had urged captain vance to so quickly set out upon his path of duty when dickory comes back said dame charter to kate he may bring some news to cheer your poor heart things got so twisted in the telling Kate shook her head. Dickory cannot tell me anything now, she said, that I care to know, knowing so much. My father is a pirate, and a king's ship has gone out to destroy him. And what could Dickory tell me that would cheer me? But Dame Charter's optimism was beginning to take heart again and to spread its wings. Ah, my dear, you don't know what good things in this life continually crop up. A letter from your father, possibly withheld by that wicked madam bonnet which is what dickory and i both think or some good words from the town that your father has sold his ship and is on his way home nobody knows what good news that dickory may bring with him the poor girl actually smiled she was young and in heart of youth there is always room for some good news or for the hope of them but her smile vanished altogether when she went to her room and wrote a letter to martin newcombe and this letter which was a long one she told her lover how troubled she had been but she had nothing now to ask him about the bad news he had in his kindness forborne to tell her and that when he saw dickory charter he might say to him from her that there was no need to make any further inquiries about her father she knew enough and far too much more most likely than any one in bridgetown knew then she told him of captain vince and the dreadful errand of the corvette badger having done this kate became as brave as any captain of a british man-of-war and she told her lover that he must think no more of her it was not for him to pay court to the daughter of a pirate and so she blessed him and bade him farewell when she had signed and sealed this letter she felt as if she had torn out a chapter of her young life and thrown it upon the fire end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Eleven: Bad Weather. When Dickory Charter sailed away from the island of Jamaica, his reason, had it been called upon, would have told him that he had a good stout brig under him on which there were people and ropes and sails and something to eat and drink but in those moments of paradise he did not trouble his reason very much and lived in an atmosphere of joy which he did not attempt to analyze but was content to breathe as if it had been the common air about him he was going away from every one he loved and yet never before had he been so happy in going to any one he loved he cared to talk to no one on board, but in company with his joy he stood and gazed westward out over the sea. He was but little younger than she was, and yet that difference, so slight, had lifted him from things of earth, and had placed him in that paradise where he now dwelt. So passed on the hours, so rolled the waves, and so moved the king and queen before the favouring breeze. It was on the second day out that the breeze began to be less favouring, and there were signs of a storm and in spite of his preoccupied condition, 
Dickory was obliged to notice the hurried talk of the officers about him, he occupying a point of vantage on the quarter-deck. Presently he turned and asked of someone if there was a likelihood of bad weather. The mate to whom he had spoken said somewhat unpleasantly, "'Bad weather enough, I take it, as we may all soon know, but it is not wind or rain. There is bad weather for you. Do you see that?' Dickory looked, and saw far away, but still distinct, a vessel under full sail, with a little black spot floating high above it. He turned to the man for explanation. "'And what is that?' he said. "'It's a pirate ship,' said the other, his face hardening as he spoke, "'and it will soon be firing at us to heave to.' At that moment there was a flash at the bow of the approaching vessel, a little smoke, and then the report of a cannon came over the water. Without further delay the captain and crew of the king and queen went to work and hove to their brig. Young Dickory Charter also hove to. He did not know exactly why, but his dream stopped sailing over a sea of delight. They stood motionless, their sails flapping in the wind. "'Pirates!' he thought to himself, cold shivers running through him. "'Is this brig to be taken?' Am I to be taken? Am I not to go to Barbados, to Bridgetown, her home? Am I not to take her back the good news which will make her happy? Are these things possible? He stared over the water. He saw the swiftly approaching vessel. He could distinguish the skull and bones upon the black flag which flew above her. These things were possible, and his heart fell. But it was not with fear. Dickory Charter was as bold a fellow as ever stood on the deck in a sea-fight, but his heart fell at the thought that he might not be going to her old home, and that he might not sail back with good news to her. As the swift-sailing pirate ship sped on, Ben Greenway came aft to Captain Bonnet, and a grievous grin was on the Scotchman's face. "'Good greetings to you, Master Bonnet,' said he. "'You're truly good to your old friends and neighbours, and pass them not by, even when your pockets are bursting with Spanish gold.' A minute before this, Captain Steed Bonnet had been in a very pleasant state of mind. It was only two days ago that he had captured a Spanish ship from which he got great gain, including considerable stores of gold. Everything of value had been secured, the tall galleon had been burned, and its crew had been marooned on a barren spot on the coast of San Domingo. The spoils had been divided, at least every man knew what his share was to be, and the officers and the crew of the Revenge were in a well-contented state of mind. In fact, Captain Bonnet would not have sailed after a little brig, certainly unsuited to carry costly cargo, had it not been that his piratical principle made it appear to him a point of conscience to prey upon all mercantile craft, little or big, which might come in his way. Thus it was that he was sailing merrily after the king and queen when Ben Greenway came to him with his disturbing words. "'What mean you?' cried Bonnet. "'Know you that vessel?' "'Aye, well,' said Ben, "'it is the king and queen, bound, doubtless, for Bridgetown. I tell you, Master Bonnet, that it was a great deal of trouble and expense you put yourself to when you went into the present line of business on this ship. You could have stayed at home, where she is owned, and with these fine fellows that you've gathered together, you might have robbed your neighbours right and left without the trouble of going to sea.' "'Ben Greenway,' roared the captain, "'I will have no more of this.' is it not enough for me to be annoyed and worried by these everlasting ships of bridgetown which keep sailing across my bows no matter in what direction i go without hearing your jeers and sneers regarding the matter i tell you ben greenway i will not have it i will not suffer these paltry vessels filled perhaps with the grocers and cloth dealers from my own town to interfere thus with the bold career that i have chosen i tell you ben greenway i'll make an example of this one I am a pirate, and I will let them know it, these fellows in their floating shops. It will be a fair and easy thing to sink this tub without more ado. I'd rather meet three Spanish ships, even had they not aboard, than one of these righteous craft commanded by my most respectable friends and neighbors. Black Paul, the sailing-master, had approached, and had heard the greater part of these remarks. "'Better board her and see what she carries,' said he, "'before we sink her.' The men have been talking about her, and many of them favour not the trouble of marooning those on board of her. So say most of us. Let's get what we can from her, and then quickly rid ourselves of her one way or another. "'Tis well,' cried Bonnet. "'We can riddle her hull and sink her.' "'With the neighbours on board?' asked Greenway. Captain Bonnet scowled blackly. "'Ben Greenway,' he shouted, "'it would serve you right if I tied you hand and foot, and bundled you on board that brig after we have stripped her, if haply she have anything on board we care for.' "'And then sink her?' asked the Scotchman. "'Aye, sink her!' 
replied Bonnet. Thus would I rid myself of a man who vexes me every moment that I lay my eyes on him, and moreover it would please you, for you would die in the midst of those friends and neighbors you have such a high regard for. That would put an end to your cackle, and there would be no gossip in the town about it. The sailing-master now came aft. The vessel had been put about, and was slowly approaching the brig. "'Shall we make fast?' asked Black Paul. "'If we do, we shall have to be quick about it. The sea is rising, and that clumsy hulk may do us damage.' For a moment Captain Bonnet hesitated. He was beginning to learn something of the risks and dangers of a nautical life, and here was real danger if the two vessels ran nearer each other. Suddenly he turned and glared at Greenway. "'Make fast!' he cried savagely. "'Make fast if it be only for a minute!' "'Do you think in your heart,' asked the Scotchman grimly, "'that you're pirate enough for that?' End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Twelve Face to Face. With her head to the wind, the pirate vessel Revenge bore down slowly upon the king and queen, now lying to and awaiting her. The stiff breeze was growing stiffer, and the sea was rising. The experienced eye of Paul Bittern, the sailing-master of the pirate, now told him that it would be dangerous to approach the brig near enough to make fast to her, even for the minute which Captain Bonnet craved, the minute which would have been long enough for a couple of sturdy fellows to toss on board the prize, that exasperating human indictment, Ben Greenway. "'We cannot do it!' shouted Black Paul to Bonnet. "'We shall run too near her as it is. "'Shall we let fly at short range and riddle her hull?' Captain Bonnet did not immediately answer. The situation puzzled him. He wanted very much to put the Scotchman on board the brig, and after that he did not care what happened. But before he could speak, there appeared on the rail of the King and Queen, holding fast to a shroud, the figure of a young man, who put his hand to his mouth and hailed, "'Throw me a line! Throw me a line!' Such an extraordinary request at such a time naturally amazed the pirates, and they stood staring, as they crowded along the side of their vessel. "'If you are not going to board her,' shouted Dickory again, "'throw me a line!' Filled with curiosity to know what this strange proceeding meant, Black Paul ordered that a line be thrown, and in a moment a tall fellow seized a coil of light rope and hurled it through the air in the direction of the brig. But the rope fell short, and the outer end of it disappeared beneath the water." Now the spirit of Black Paul was up. If the fellow on the brig wanted a line, he wanted to come aboard, and if he wanted to come aboard, he should do so. So he seized a heavier coil, and swinging it around his head, sent it with tremendous force towards Dickory, who made a wild grab at it and caught it. Although a comparatively light line, it was a long one, and the slack of it was now in the water, so that Dickory had to pull hard upon it before he could grasp enough of it to pass around his body. He had scarcely done this, and had made a knot in it, before a lurch of the brig brought a strain on the rope, and he was incontinently jerked overboard. The crew of the merchantmen, who had not had time to comprehend what the young fellow was about to do, would have grasped him had he remained on the rail a moment longer, but now he was gone into the sea, and working vigorously with his legs and his arms, was endeavouring to keep his head above water while the pirates at the other end of the rope pulled him swiftly towards their vessel. Great was the excitement on board the Revenge. Why should a man from a merchantman endeavour alone to board a vessel which flew the Jolly Roger? Did he wish to join the crew? Had they been ill-treating him on board the brig? Was he a criminal endeavouring to escape from the officers of the law? It was impossible to answer any of these questions, and so the swarthy rascals pulled so hard and so steadily upon the line that the knot in it, which Dickory had not tied properly, became a slip-knot, and the poor fellow's breath was nearly squeezed out of him as he was hauled over the rough water. When he reached the vessel's side there was something said about lowering a ladder, but the men who were hauling on the line were in a hurry to satisfy their curiosity, so up came Dickory straight from the water to the rail, and that proceeding so increased the squeezing that the poor fellow fell upon the deck scarcely able to gasp. When the rope was loosened, the half-drowned and almost breathless Dickory raised himself and gave two or three deep breaths, but he could not speak despite the fact that a dozen rough voices were asking him who he was and what he wanted. With the water pouring from him in streams, and his breath coming from him in puffs, he looked about him with great earnestness. Suddenly, 
a man rushed through the crowd of pirates and stopped to look at the person who had so strangely come aboard then he gave a shout it's dickory charter he cried dickory charter the son of old dame charter ye dickory and how in the name o all that's blessed did you come here master bonnet master bonnet he shouted to the captain who now stood by it's young dickory charter of bridgetown he was on board this vessel before we sailed with mistress kate and me the last time i saw her he was with her what exclaimed bonnet with my daughter ay ay said greenway it must have been a little before she went on shore young man cried bonnet stooping towards dickory when did you last see my daughter do you know anything of her the young man opened his mouth but he could not yet do much in the way of speaking but he managed to gasp i come from her i am bringing you a message a message from kate shouted bonnet now in a state of wild excitement here you greenway lift up the other arm and we will take him to my cabin quick man quick man he must have some spirits and dry clothes make haste now a message from my daughter if that's so said greenway as he and bonnet hurried the young man aft you better not be in too great haste to get his message out of him or you'll kill him with pure recklessness bonnet took the advice and before many minutes dickory was in dry clothes and feeling the inspiriting influence of a glass of good old rum now came black paul wanting to know if he should sink the brig and be done with her for they couldn't lie by in such weather don't you fire on that ship yelled bonnet don't you dare it for all i know my daughter may be on board of her at this dickory shook his head no said he she is not on board then let her go cried bonnet i have no time to fool with the beggarly hulk let her go i have other business here and now sir addressing dickory what of my daughter you have got your breath now tell me quickly what is your message from her when did you sail from bridgetown did she expect me to overhaul that brig how in the name of all the devils could she expect that come come now master bonnet exclaimed the scotchman you're talking to your daughter the good and beautiful mistress kate and no matter whether you're a pirate or not you must keep a guard on your tongue and if you think she knew where to find you you must consider her an angel and not to be spoken of in the same breath as devils i didn't sail from bridgetown said dickory and your daughter is not there i came from jamaica where she now is and was bound to bridgetown to seek news of you hoping that you had returned there which if he had said ben who found it very difficult to keep quiet you would have been under the necessity of giving your message to his bones hanging in chains bonnet looked savagely at ben but he had no time even to curse jamaica he cried but how did she get there tell me quickly sir tell me quickly do you hear dickory was now quite recovered and he told his story not too quickly and with much attention to details even the account of the unusual manner in which he and kate had disembarked from the pirate vessel was given without curtailment nor with any attention to the approving grunts of ben greenway when he came to speak of the letter which mr newcombe had written her and which had thrown her into such despair on account of its shortcomings captain bonnet burst into a fury of execration and she never got my letter he cried and knew not what had happened to me it is that wife of mine that cruel wildcat i sent the letter to my house thinking of course it would find my daughter there for where else should she be and a most extraordinary wise man you were to do that said ben greenway for you might a known if he had ever thought of it at all that the place where your wife was was the place where your daughter couldn't a be and ye not with her if ye had spoke to me about it it would a gone to mr newcombe and then ye'd a known that she'd be sure to get it at this a slight cloud passed over dickory's face and in spite of the misfortunes which had followed upon the non-delivery of her father's letter he could not help congratulating himself that it had not been sent to the care of that man newcombe he had not time to formulate the reasons why this proceeding would have been so distasteful to him but he wanted martin newcombe to have nothing to do with the good or bad fortune of mistress kate whose champion he had become and whose father he had found and to whom he was now talking face to face the three talked for a long time during which black paul had put the vessel about upon her former course and was sailing swiftly to the north as dickory went on bonnet ceased to curse but over and over blessed his brother-in-law as a good man and one of the few worthy to take into his charge the good and beautiful steed bonnet had always been very fond of his daughter and now as it became known to him into what desperate and direful condition his reckless conduct had thrown her he loved her more and more and grieved greatly for the troubles he had brought upon her but it'll be all right now he cried she's with her good uncle who will show her the most gracious kindness both for her mother's sake and for her own 
and I will see to it that she be not too heavy a charge upon him. "'As for you, Dickory,' exclaimed Greenway, "'you're a brave boy, and will come to be an honour to your mother's declining years and to the memory of your father. But how did ye ever come to think aboard in this nest of sea devils, and at such risk to your life?' "'I did it,' said Dickory simply, "'because Mistress Kate's father was here, and I was bound to come to him wherever I should find him, for that was my main errand. They told me on the brig that it was Captain Bonnet's ship that was overhauling us, and I vowed that as soon as she boarded us I would seek him out and give him her message, and when I heard that the sea was getting too heavy for you to board us, I determined to come on board if I could get a hold of a line.' "'Young man,' cried Bonnet, rising to his full height and swelling his chest, "'I bestow upon you a father's blessing.' "'More than that,' and as he spoke he pulled open a drawer of a small locker, "'here's a bag of gold pieces, and when you take my answer you shall have another like it.' But Dickory did not reach out his hand for the money, nor did he say a word. "'Don't be afraid,' cried Bonnet. "'If you have any religious scruples, I will tell you that this gold I did not get by piracy. It is part of my private fortune, and came as honestly to me as I now give it to you.' But Dickory did not reach out his hand." Now up spoke Ben Greenway. "'Look ye, boy,' said he, "'as long as there's a chance left "'a getting honest gold on board this vessel, "'I pray ye, seize it, "'and if you're afraid of this gold, "'thinking it may be smeared with the blood of fathers "'and the tears of mothers, "'I tell ye one thing, and that is, "'that Master Bonnet hasn't a got to be so much of a pirate "'that he willna tell the truth. "'So I'll take the money for ye, Dickory, "'and I'll keep it till you're ready to take it to your mother, "'and I hope that will be soon.'" End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Thirteen the pirate vessel revenge was now bound to the coast of the carolinas and virginia and perhaps even farther north if her wicked fortune should favor her the growing commerce of the colonies offered great prizes in those days to the piratical cruisers which swarmed up and down the atlantic coast to lie over for a time off the coast of charlestown was Captain Bonnet's immediate object, and to get there as soon as possible was almost a necessity. The crew of desperate scoundrels whom he had gathered together had discovered that their captain knew nothing of navigation or the management of a ship, and there were many of them who believed that if Black Paul had chosen to turn the vessel's bows to the coast of South America, Bonnet would not have known that they were not sailing northward. Thus, they had lost all respect for him, and their conduct was kept within bounds only by the cruel punishments which he inflicted for disobedience or general bad conduct and which were rendered possible by the dissensions and bad feelings among the men themselves one clique or faction being always ready to help punish another consequently the landsman pirate would speedily have been tossed overboard and the command given to another had it not been that the men were not at all united in their opinions as to who that other should be there was also another very good reason for bonnet's continuance in authority he was a good divider and so far had been a good provider if he should continue to take prizes and to give each man under him his fair share of the plunder the men were likely to stand by him until some good reason came for their changing their minds so with floggings and irons on deck and below and with fair winds filling the sails above the revenge kept on her way and in spite of the curses and quarrels and threats which polluted the air through which the stout ship sailed there were always good-natured companionship wherever the captain dickory and ben greenway found themselves together 
there seemed to be no end to the questions which bonnet asked about his daughter and when he had asked them all he began over again and dickory made answer as he had done before the young fellow was growing very anxious at this northern voyage and when he asked questions they always related to the probability of his getting back to jamaica with news from the father of mistress kate bonnet the captain encouraged the hopes of an early return and vowed to dickory that he would send him to spanish town with a letter to his daughter just as soon as an opportunity would show itself when the revenge reached the mouth of charlestown harbor she stationed herself there and in four days captured three well-laden merchantmen two bound outward and one going in from england thus all went well and with willing hands to man her yards and a proudly strutting captain on her quarter-deck the pirate ship renewed her northward course and spread terror and made prizes even as far as the new england coast and if dickory had had any doubts that the late reputable planter of bridgetown had now become a veritable pirate he had many opportunities of setting himself right bonnet seemed to be growing proud of his newly acquired taste for rapacity and cruelty merchantmen were recklessly robbed and burned their crews and passengers even babes and women being set on shore in some desolate spot to perish or survive the pirate cared not which and if resistance were offered bloody massacres or heartless drownings were almost sure to follow and as his men coveted spoils and delighted in cruelty he satisfied them to their heart's content i tell you dickory charter said he one day when you see my daughter i want you to make her understand that i am a real pirate and not playing at the business she's a brave girl my daughter kate and what i do she would have me do well and not half-heartedly to make her ashamed of me and then there is my brother-in-law delaplaine i don't think that he had a very high opinion of me when i was a plain farmer and planter and i want him to think better of me now a bold fearless pirate cannot be looked upon with disrespect dickory groaned in his heart that this man was the father of kate turning southward rounding the cape of delaware the revenge ran up the bay seeking some spot where she might take in water casting anchor before a little town on the coast of new jersey here while some of the men were taking in water others of the crew were allowed to go on shore their captain swearing to them that if they were guilty of any disorder they should suffer for it on my vessel he swore i am a pirate but when i go on shore i am a gentleman and every one in my service shall behave himself as a gentleman i beg of you to remember that agreeable to this principle captain bonnet arrayed himself in a fine suit of clothes and without arms excepting a genteel sword and carrying a cane he landed with ben greenway and dickory and proceeded to indulge himself in a promenade up the main street of the town the citizens of the place terrified and amazed at this bold conduct of a vessel fearlessly flying a black flag with the skull and bones could do nothing but await their fate the women and children and many of the men hid themselves in garrets and cellars and those of the people who were obliged to remain visible trembled and prayed but captain steed bonnet walked boldly up the right-hand side of the main street waving his cane in the air as he spoke to the people assuring them that he and his men came on an errand of business seeking nothing but some fresh water and an opportunity to stretch their legs on solid ground 
if you have meat and drink he cried bestow it freely upon my men tired of the unsavory food on shipboard and if they transgress the laws of hospitality then i their captain shall be your avenger we want none of your goods or money having enough in our well-laden vessel to satisfy all your necessities if ye have them and to feel it not the men strolled along the street swarmed into the two little taverns soon making away with their small stores of ale and spirits and accepting everything eatable offered them by the shivering citizens but as to violence there was none for every man of the rascally crew bore enmity against most of the others and held himself ready for a chance to report a shipmate or to break his head black paul was a powerful aid in the preservation of order among the disorderly conflicts between factions of the crew were greatly feared by him for the schemes which happy chance had caused to now revolve themselves in his master mind would have been sadly interfered with by want of concord among the men of the revenge captain bonnet followed at a short distance by dickory and ben was interested in everything he saw a man of intelligence and considerable reading it pleased him to note the peculiarities of the people of a country which he had never visited the houses the shops and even the attire of the citizens were novel and well worthy of his observation he looked over garden walls he gazed out upon the fields which were visible from the upper end of the street and when he saw a man who was able to command his speech he asked him questions there was a little church standing back from the thoroughfare its door wide open and this was an instant attraction to the pirate captain who opened the gate of the yard and walked up to it that i should ever again see master steed bonnet go into a church was something i didna dream o dickory said ben greenway it will be a miracle and i doubt if he dares to pass the door with his sins and his plunders on his head but captain bonnet did pass the door reverentially removing his hat if not his crimes as he entered in but few ways it resembled the houses of worship to which he had been accustomed in his earlier days and he gazed eagerly from side to side as he slowly walked up the central aisle dickory was about to follow him but he was suddenly jerked back by the scotchman who forcibly drew him away from the door look ye whispered ben speaking quickly under great excitement look ye dickory heaven has sent us our chance he's in there safe and sound and the good angels will keep his mind occupied i'll quietly close the door and turn the key then i'll slip around to the back and if there be another door there i'll stop it some way if it be not already locked now dickory boy make your heels fly i noticed before we got here that some of the men were making their way to the boats dash ye among them dickory and tell them that the day they've been longing for ever since they set foot on the vessel has now come their captain is a prisoner and they are free to hurry on board their vessel and carry away with em ah their vile plunder what exclaimed dickory speaking so earnestly that the scotchman pulled him farther away from the church do you mean that you would leave captain bonnet here by himself in a foreign town no a bit of it said ben i'll stay with him, and so will you now run dickory ben exclaimed the other you don't know what you are talking about captain bonnet would be seized and tried as a pirate his blood would be on your head ben i canna talk about that now said ben impatiently ye think too much of the man's body dickory and i am considering his soul and i am considering his daughter said dickory fearlessly do you suppose i am going to help to have her father hanged and with these words he made a movement towards the door 
the eager scotchman seized him dickory bethink yourself said he i don't want to hang him i want to save him body and soul we will get him away from here after the ship has gone he will be helpless then he canna be a pirate a minute longer and he will give up and do what i tell him we can leave before there is only talk o trial or hanging run dickory run ye're sinfully losin time think o his soul dickory it's his only chance with a great jerk dickory freed himself from the grasp of the scotchman it is kate bonnet i'm thinking of he exclaimed and with that he bolted into the church the captain was examining the little pulpit haste ye haste ye cried dickory your men are all hurrying to the boats they will leave you behind if they can that's what they are after bonnet turned quickly he took in the situation in a second with a few bounds he was out of the church nearly overturning ben greenway as he passed him without a word he ran down the street his cane thrown away and his drawn sword in his hand dickory's warning had not come a minute too soon one boat full of men was pulling towards the ship and others were hurrying in the direction of an empty boat which awaited them at the pier bonnet with dickory close at his heels ran with a most amazing rapidity while greenway followed at a little distance scarcely able to maintain the speed what means this cried bonnet now no longer a gentleman but a savage pirate and as he spoke he thrust aside two of the men who were about to get into the boat and jumped in himself what means this he thundered black paul answered quietly i was getting the men on board he said so as to save time and i was coming back for you bonnet glared at his sailing master but he did not swear at him he was too useful a man but in his heart he vowed that he would never trust paul bittern again and that as soon as he could he would get rid of him but when he reached the ship three men out of each boat's crew selected at random to represent the rest were tied up and flogged the blows being well laid on by scoundrels very eager to be brutal even to their own shipmates ah oh, dickory dickory cried ben greenway as they were sailing down the bay ye have loaded your soul with sin on this day i fear ye'll never rise from under it whatever vile deeds that major bonnet may henceforth be guilty o ye'll be responsible for them a dickory for every ain of em he's bad enough ben said the other and it's many a wicked deed he may do yet but i am going to carry news of him to his daughter if i can and what's more i am not going to stay behind and be hanged even if it is in such good company as major bonnet and you ben greenway whatever should happen on the rest of that voyage whether the well-intentioned treachery of ben greenway or the secret villainies of the crew should prevail whether disaster or success should come to the planter pirate dickory charter resolved in his soul that a message from her father should go to kate bonnet and that he should carry it the spirits of dickory rose very much as the bow of the revenge was pointed southward every mile that the pirate vessel sailed brought him nearer to the delivery of his message a message which while it told of her father's wicked career still told her of his safety and of his steadfast affection for her indirectly the bringing of such a message and the story of how the bearer brought it might have another effect which although he had no right to expect was never absent from dickory's soul this ardent young lover did not believe in master martin newcombe he had no good reason for not believing in him but his want of faith did not depend upon reason if lovers reasoned too much it would be a sad world for many of them when the revenge stopped in her progress towards the heavenly island of jamaica 
or at least that island which was the abode of an angel and anchored off charlestown harbor south carolina dickory fumed and talked impatiently to his friend ben greenway why a man even though he were a pirate and therefore of an avaricious nature should want more booty when his vessel was already crowded with valuable goods he could not imagine but ben greenway could very easily imagine when the spirit of sin is upon ye said the scotchman the more and more wicked ye're likely to be and ye must no forget dickory that every new crime he commits and of the property he steals and of the unfortunate people he maroons will have to be answered for by ye dickory when the time comes for ye to stand up and say what ye had got to say about your ain sins if ye had stood by me and helped to cut him short in his nefarious career he might now be beginning a new life in some small coastin vessel bound for barbados dickory gave an impatient kick at the mast near which he was standing it would have been more likely said he that before this he would have begun a new life on the gallows with you and me alongside of him and how do you suppose you would have got rid of the sin on your soul when you thought of his orphan daughter in jamaica your thoughts are too much on that daughter snapped greenway and no enough on her father's soul i am tired of her father's soul said dickory i wonder what new piece of mischief they are going to do here there are no ships to be robbed dickory did not know very much or care very much about the sea and its commerce and some ships to be robbed soon made their appearance one was a large merchantman with a full cargo and the other was a bark northward bound in ballast the acquisition of the latter vessel put a new idea into captain bonnet's head the revenge was already overloaded and he determined to take the bark as a tender to relieve him of a portion of his cargo and to make herself useful in the business of marooning and such troublesome duties being now commander of two vessels which might in time increase to a little fleet captain bonnet's ideas of his own importance as a terror of the sea increased rapidly on the revenge he was more despotic and severe than ever before while the villain who had been chosen to command the tender because he had a fair knowledge of navigation was informed that if he kept the bark more than a mile from the flagship he would be sunk with the vessel and all on board the loss of the bark and some men would be nothing compared to the maintenance of discipline quoth the planter pirate bonnet's ambition rose still higher and higher he was not content with being a relentless pirate bloody if need be but he longed for recognition for a position among his fellow terrors of the sea which should be worthy of a truly wicked reputation a pirate bold he would consort with pirates bold so he set sail for the gulf of honduras then a great rendezvous for piratical craft of many nations if the father of kate bonnet had captured and burned a dozen ships and had forced every sailor and passenger thereupon to walk a plank he would not have sinned more deeply in the eyes of dickory charter than he did by thus ruthlessly inhumanely hard-heartedly and altogether shamefully ignoring and pitilessly passing by that island on which dwelt an angel his own daughter but bonnet declared to the young man that it would now be dangerous for him and his ship to approach the harbor of kingston generally the resort of british men-o-war but in the waters of honduras he could not fail to find some quiet merchant ship by which he could send a message to his daughter ay and in which and the pirate's eye glistened with parental joy as this thought came into his mind he might disguised as a plain gentleman make a visit to mistress kate and to his good brother-in-law delaplaine 
so dickory was now to be satisfied and even to admit that there might be some good common sense in these remarks of that most uncommon pirate captain bonnet so the revenge with her tender sailed southward through the fair west indian waters and by the fair west indian isles to join herself to the piratical fleet generally to be found in the waters of honduras End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of kate bonnet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Kate Bonnet, The Romance of a Pirate's Daughter By Frank R. Stockton Chapter 14 A Girl to the Front The days were getting very long at Spanish Town, although there were no more hours of sunlight than was usual at the season and even the optimism of Dame Charter was scarcely able to brighten her own soul, much less that of Kate Bonnet, who had almost forgotten what it was to be optimistic. Poor Mr. Delaplaine, whose life had begun to cheer up wonderfully since the arrival of his niece and her triumphant entry into the society of the town, became more gloomy than he had been since the months which followed the death of his wife over and over did he wish that his brother-in-law bonnet had long since been shut up in some place where his eccentricities could do no harm to his fellow-creatures especially to his most lovely daughter mistress kate bonnet was not a girl to sit quietly under the tremendous strain which bore upon her after the departure of the badger how could she be contented or even quiet at any moment when at that moment that heartless Captain Vince might have his sword raised above the head of her unfortunate father. Uncle, she said, I cannot bear it any longer. I must do something. But, my dear, he asked, looking down upon her with infinite affection, what can you do? We are here upon an immovable island, and your father and Captain Vince a sailing upon the sea nobody knows where i thought about it all last night said kate and this is what i will do i will go to the governor i will tell him all about my father i do not think it will be wrong even to tell him why i think his mind has become unsettled for if that woman in bridgetown has behaved wickedly her wickedness should be known then I will ask him to give me written authority to take my father wherever I may find him, and to bring him here, where it shall be decided what shall be done with him. And I am sure the decision will be that he must be treated as a man whose mind is not right, and who should be put somewhere where he can have nothing to do with ships. This was all quite childish to Mr. Delaplaine but for Kate's dear sake he treated her scheme seriously. "'But tell me, my dear,' said he, "'how are you going to find your father, and in what way can you bring him back here with you?' "'The first thing to do,' said Kate, "'is to hire a ship. I know that my little property will yield me money enough for that. As for bringing him back, that's for me to do.' With my arms around his neck, he cannot be a pirate, Captain. And think of it, Uncle. If my arms are not soon around his neck, it may be the hangman's rope which will be there. That is, if he is not killed by that revengeful Captain Vince. Mr. Delaplaine was troubled far more than he had yet been. His sorrowing niece believed that there was something which might be done for her father, but he her practical uncle, did not believe that anything could be done. And, even if this were possible, he did not wish to do it. If, by some unheard-of miracle, his niece should be enabled to carry out her scheme, she could not go alone, 
and thoughts of sailing upon the sea and the dangers from pirates storms and wrecks were very terrible to the quiet merchant he could not encourage this night-born scheme of his niece but there is one thing i can do cried kate and i must do it this very day i must go to the governor's house and i pray you uncle that you will go with me i must tell him about my father i must make him do something which will keep that captain vince from sailing after him and killing him how i wish i had thought of all this before but it did not come to me it was not half an hour after that when kate and her uncle entered the grounds of the governor's mansion End of chapter 14